Okay, we're here with Ranveer. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do at Microsoft Research. Yeah, I am a senior researcher at Microsoft Research in the Mobility and Networking Research Group. I've been at Microsoft Research for about eight and a half years now. Great, and you work uh, in um, Wi-Fi with, uh, with Whitespace. Tell us a little bit what is Whitespace for people who might not know. To start with, Whitespace is refers to, so in the technical term, uh, white space as well, anything which is blank is white space. In the context of frequencies, wireless frequencies, any unused spectrum is what we refer to as white spaces. So to give you a bigger overview, a broader overview of what the problem is and how it came about, why is this an important problem? So back in 2004, the FCC issued a notice of proposal for rulemaking saying, hey, this wireless spectrum is really occupied. There are these TV bands. Not all of it is in use all the time. Can we opportunistically use the unused TV spectrum for wireless communication, for Wi-Fi-like communication? And since then, I joined in 2005, and since then I have been looking at this problem, investigating it, seeing, okay, so the wireless spectrum is occupied, but portions of it are actually not in use. First, we wanted to quantify how much of the spectrum is not in use. Then finding that out, we built a protocol which we called Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi over the white spaces, where we took a commodity Wi-Fi chipset, built the extra hardware around it, and showed that you could operate in these empty TV frequencies without actually interfering with TV transmissions. When we started doing it back in 2005, there was nothing, right? It was all just a vague idea that how would you go about doing it. When, when we started, the first step we took was actually build the first piece, piece of hardware. Now, there are two approaches to go about doing it. We could actually sense the medium, you could find out that is you could have a separate chip on your device. Imagine your phone with a separate chip. What that chip is doing is it's sensing the medium to see whether that, by medium I mean the entire RF frequencies, to find out which channel is available, which channel is not. So we built the system around it that, that would sense the medium. It would send that information up to the operating system. We built a platform on Windows. The operating system would then instruct the radio to operate, to send signals in the empty TV channels. That was uh, how we started. Then the next uh, question we asked was, OK, from a scientific perspective, we've shown how you could achieve this kind of, we call it dynamic spectrum access. Well, how would it actually work in practice? How would you get it in the hands of people? That's when we realized having this separate chip on the phone would make it more costly, would consume more power. It wouldn't really work. So then from 2008 onwards to 2010, we actually built another system. We built a system that spanned all of Microsoft campus. We deployed two white space base stations, one on building 112, one on building 18. And we, and then we showed that you could actually, and then we used, instead of a chip on the device, we used a web service to tell you at that location what channels were available. So is using the spectrum different from what we do now with uh, like my router at home? Yeah. What, tell us about the system that you had to architect for this. Right, so th that's a good question. So. Before I go there, first let me tell you what are the benefits of even using the white spaces. Why are we even looking at this new spectrum? There are two main reasons why we are looking at the spectrum. One is you might be hearing all this news going around of, well, there's a spectrum crunch. We don't have enough spectrum. Well, we do have a lot of spectrum. It's just that it's not available for us to use. Right? For example, TV was a classic example where there are these TV channels that's been allocated to TV, but it's not in use. So if we can start using it, so this is a new paradigm, right? So using, this is the first point, that is white spaces gives you additional spectrum for the wireless data demand that's happening right now. The second benefit of the TV white spaces is range. That is because it's in the lower frequencies, you can get four times the distance at the same transmit power than you can get over Wi-Fi over 2.4 gigahertz. Over five gigahertz, that's 11A, 11N, these are the terms that you hear. So compared to a standard 11G system, we've done experiments where you can easily get four times the distance in free space. That is, if there was no obstructions, I could get, I could, so for example, your Wi-Fi router at home, you can access it at four times the distance than you can right now. That is, in free space, it's four times. When you have buildings and obstructions, it's much more. In fact, that was the example I was telling you before, that if you had to cover all of Microsoft campus over here, which is one mile by one mile, using Wi-Fi, you would need hundreds of Wi-Fi routers. With the white spaces, what we showed is with just two base stations, one on building 112 and one on building 18, we could blanket all of campus. You did some uh, work with the Xbox One team. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. So 
uh, I'm a wireless guy, right? The reason I joined Microsoft Research rather than going to academia was because I wanted to ship the work I did as part of my internship here. So I've, I've had lots of interactions with the product teams over the years, but the Xbox One came, out, came up as a unique opportunity where it came as a, uh, the Xbox team approached me and they said, hey, we have this interesting problem. We want to design a new wireless protocol from your controller to the console. And you might think, well, these are just button clicks. Why do we need a fancy protocol? But well, these button clicks are important because you need a predictable latency for these button clicks. If you look at the Xbox One controller, it supports chat. You can have a headset attached to the controller. Once you have chat traffic, you have high throughput traffic, which also needs latency guarantees. So if you look at the entire research that has happened, or even the way in the industry has moved about, all the press that is going out, go, uh, that is going around about wireless, uh, the new innovations in wireless, everyone's talking about how do you push more bits in the air? How do you get more capacity from your wireless network? No one's really talking about how do you get this extra capacity while getting a predictable latency. And, and what are the, uh, the impacts that it has on latency? What are the differences from what we had before? Right, so earlier, earlier systems just couldn't achieve the throughput while maintaining the latency. So there's no system right now, the Xbox 360, the PS3, or the PS4, none of them have this capability to get the throughput and the latency that we can achieve with the Xbox One. So we can support several types of traffic classes, different traffic classes, each with their own throughput and latency guarantees, and we are able to achieve that those guarantees, both in terms of throughput and latency, which no other system can achieve right now. So the way we achieved that, well, there were lots of innovation happening, starting from the wireless layer, where we were looking at fading, for example. To, to, to define fading, what I mean is, if I send a signal to you, the signal that you're getting, well, people say that th there's a term called RSSI, received signal strength. If I'm sending a signal, I'm transmitting some signal to you, you're not going to receive it at the same power. You see a lot of fluctuation in the power that you see. And the fluctuation that you see is pretty significant and for certain periods of time. This is called fading, and we had to counter it. This is just one of the problems that we had to counter. That is, even when the signal gets slow, how do you make sure that my packets still get to you? Right? Then there are many other issues. For example, what modulation scheme should I use? So uh, if I'm sending a packet to you, I just don't send the packets one zeros. I modulate it. I, the way I send it over the medium is I encode the entire packet before sending it out. And the, the lower the modulation scheme, the lower throughput I get, but the more robust it is. Now, these are, again, schemes that we had to play with. We had to ensure that you're sending it with the right modulation so that the packet gets through to the other side within the, the deadline. Uh, that we had to meet for that kind of traffic. Yeah. I know one of your focuses is in uh, energy efficiency. Yeah. Talk about the challenges that you have with uh, maintaining mm. long battery life when uh, using yeah. a radio. Yeah, uh, so, well, battery is a big pain point for nearly everyone who has a mobile phone or a tablet, right, or even a laptop for that matter. So we started this work back in 2010 where uh, I was essentially leading a virtual team inside MSR with a bunch of researchers all over the world, all the labs, and spanning areas of expertise from hardware to security to software to uh, just software engineering to programming languages, networking, systems, hardware, sensors, everything. And we came up, we had a mission. The mission was of our group was, hey, let's try to achieve a battery life of one week without charge for a phone. That is, you shouldn't need to plug your, your phone for one week. Now, that was, it's an ambitious mission. Well, mission statements have to be ambitious. So that is what we set out with. And with that, we are looking at all the different parts of the stack, starting from batteries, that is looking at chemistry of batteries, trying to investigate new chemistries that are out there. We're talking to a bunch of startups, trying to see, would a new type of battery make sense? We're also looking at the operating system, how, how should the operating system actually use the characteristics of the battery? How should, so, and also we're looking at techniques within the OS, for example, the scheduling algorithms, how should they be energy aware? And also a lot of application layer stuff as well. So right from the battery to the OS to the applications, we are looking at all across the stack. For example, we wrote a paper which was in Mobisys 2012, I think, which was around email energy efficiency. How much energy does email consume? And you'd be surprised that each incoming email when your screen is off consumes a lot of power. It turns on the radio, right? Your screen is off. I'm getting incoming emails. I enable push. Every incoming email turns the radio on. Once the radio is on, it doesn't immediately go back to sleep when the, when the email is received. 
In fact, once I receive the email, the radio turns on, the processor turns on as well, because that's where all the emails are stored. It needs to receive the email, do the processing. And even the radio itself, it's, it has something called a tail time. Every time it wakes up, even after your transactions are done, it will be awake for a few seconds. In some cases, more than 10 seconds, doing nothing. It's just in the on state. And in the on state, it consumes a lot of power off the order of a watt in some of our measurements with LDE. So these are the kind of things which we've investigated. And we are looking at all the different components, starting from your CPU, your radio, your display, your disk storage is another memory. How do you reduce the energy consumed by each of these components? So our work is spanning all the different parts of the stack. And that, that's the thing with energy. There's no, I don't think there's a silver bullet. We need to attack it from all possible corners. Just try to reduce the energy consumption in every component. And together, we'll see a lot of benefits. Yeah. One of the first projects that you worked on uh, at Microsoft was virtual Wi-Fi. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, what is it? And uh, yeah. it had quite a, a lot of downloads. What did people use it for? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question because it's, uh, it started in 2002, this work, when I was an intern here. Uh, Victor asked me this question. Hey, can you enable ad hoc mode? And so that time it was ad hoc was peer-to-peer -peer mode and infrastructure mode at the same time. The vision was the following. Right now, you click on your wireless icon. You select one network to connect to. The vision was, what if you could select multiple of them and say, hey, connect me to all of them? And that, had, that can have many benefits. One of them is I could get more capacity. I'll just aggregate more throughput, right? I'll get more. So this was one of the use cases that people were using it for. So I, I built the software around it. This was for Windows XP. It had uh, a kernel driver. People had to, I, I wrote the kernel driver, which people had to install. It had a software service. And it would, allow, it would allow you to do that. You could be connected to multiple networks at the same time. Now, uh, when we came here, of course, there wasn't much interest within at that time to ship it because it was too ambitious. Shipping a kernel level driver is not easy coming from research. Yeah. So we ended up uh, publishing the, uh, the sources and the binaries for download. And then we got lots of downloads. We got, uh, right now, I think it's 250,000 plus count. And people use it, a lot of people who use it are for in enterprise networks. They use it for kind of secluding people to different, so they have different Wi-Fi networks for different purposes. And people have different roles. So they will be able to connect to different networks at the same time. So we got a, a lot of good reviews around the software and people who are using it. But what shipped in Windows 7 was a much mini version of our vision that we had well, to allow you to connect to all the networks. What ships in Windows 7 and beyond is the ability for a user to be a Wi-Fi access point and be connected to another network at the same time. So that functionality is there. It was called Soft AP. And it evolved into a Wi-Fi standard called Wi-Fi Direct. So Wi-Fi Direct, right now, it's shipping in Windows 8, Windows 8.1. All, all the devices, Android and iPhone devices, are shipping it. It's built on top of virtual Wi-Fi. And what's next on the horizon? Uh, as far as research goes? Well, as far as Wi-Fi and, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. energy efficiency. Right, so energy efficiency, we are not there to our mission, right? And there, we are investigating a lot of different things in energy. I'll tell you two different big bets we have taken on energy. And we are pushing hard on both. This is cross-group effort, again, both of them. One is offload. That is, so as I said, right, we want to get to 7x energy gains. How do we get there? All the minor tweaks, well, it's going to give us a little bit of benefit. It's not going to get us to 7x a week without charge. So how do we get there? One big bet, as I said, is offload. That is, offload your, uh, we want to offload applications, processes that are running on the main device to either a low power core, instead of running it on the entire heavyweight core or the CPU and everything else on your device, there's a low power core on which it could run, or it could be offloaded to the cloud. Rather than, so your device can be completely asleep while all the, the processing is being run in the cloud. The second big bet we have, which we are actively investigating, is around battery technologies and how the OS should use it. So there we are, uh, we have some ideas around if you had many batteries, how should you actually intelligently use them? And even if you have a single battery, uh, right now the OS or your entire system treats the battery as just an energy reservoir. While, it while, the, while the OS, very fine, it, it manages the CPU, memory, and disk, and network in a very fine-grained way. But it doesn't really care much about the battery. And we believe that with a tight integration, and if the OS is more battery aware of the battery characteristics, things such as how old is my battery? 
what's the temperature around me how uh, what is the workload going to be how many high power that's when when are we getting high high workload high current workloads when are we getting low current workloads and so on so this is another active piece of work in in the energy space so if you're using uh, this white space how can you assure that you're not going to step on other frequencies that are actually being used right so here uh, when we started this work one of the things was well how do you determine which part of the spectrum is not in use we need to do that very accurately and the second thing is when we transmit we need to make sure that any of the transmissions don't cause interference to the primary users of that spectrum in this case the tv so when we were doing that we built a system which was able to do that using both we first showed it using sensing the second step we showed it using the geolocation web service where you did not need this extra chipset well thank you so much for talking to us today yeah thanks